Alright, good day everyone. So for today, I'll be discussing chapter 4 of our syllabus, which is capacity planning. Okay, so uh, we have some quite uh, sections here and uh, I do hope you, you won't get bored with my session. So yeah, uh, let's start. So first, uh, what is capacity planning? Okay. So, the word capacity means uh, the upper limit or ceiling on the load that an operating unit can handle. So, as for capacity planning, uh, it refers to the process of determining how much resource you're going to need to meet demand. This sounds easy, but there are some difficulties in actually measuring capacity in certain cases. So, uh, up, to the, up to this point, uh, we have been using a general definition of capacity. Although it is functional, uh, it can be refined into two useful definitions of capacity. Uh, we have the design capacity and effective capacity. So the definition here sounds uh, very mathematics. So just to make it somehow uh, shallow, uh, design uh, capacity is the theoretical maximum output a system may produce in a specific time frame under perfect cir circumstances on the other hand uh, effective capacity is the maximum outcome that the firm can produce with a particular period based on the constraints such as quality handling of materials and delay so it is the real outcome of the firm so we will discuss more of this on the following section. Okay, so there are actually three key inputs to capacity planning. Okay, so first, uh, the kind of capacity that will be needed, which depends on the products and services that management intends to produce or provide. Then, uh, how much will be needed, and when it will be needed. So both. Uh, can be answered by forecast key inputs. Okay. So, operations management has a lot of processes and you think this capacity planning is even important? Well, yeah, of course. Well, the main goal of capacity planning is to achieve a match between the long-term supply capabilities of an organization and the predictive level of long-term demand. Organizations become involved in capacity planning to anticipate or handle changes in demand, uh, changes in technology, changes in the environment, and perceived threats or opportunities. Okay, so let's now discuss some of its importance. So first, uh, capacity decisions have a real impact on the ability of the organization to meet future demands for pro products and services. Uh, so capacity essentially limits the rate of output uh, possible. Uh, having capacity to satisfy demand can often allow a company to take advantage of tremendous benefits. Next, capacity decisions affect operating costs. Well, ideally, capacity and demand requirements will be matched, which will tend to minimize operating costs. Next, capacity is usually a major determinant of initial costs. So typically, the greater the capacity of a productive unit, the greater its cost. This does not necessarily imply a one-for-one -one relationship. Larger units tend to cost propor proportionately less than small, smaller units. Okay. Next, capacity decisions often involve long-term commitment of resources and the fact that once they are implemented, those decisions may be difficult or impossible to modify without incurring major costs. Fifth, capacity decisions can affect competitiveness. So, if a firm has excess capacity or, uh, or can quickly add capacity, the fact may serve as a barrier to entry by other firms. Then, two, uh, capacity can affect delivery speed, which can be a competitive advantage. Next, ca 
capacity affects the ease of management. Having appropriate capacity makes management easier than when capacity is mismatched. That's why, as mentioned earlier, no, our, our main goal is doing capacity planning. Our main goal in doing capacity planning is to meet the demand. Okay. Next, globalization has increased the importance and the complexity of uh, capacity decisions. So, uh, far-flung su uh, supply chains and distant markets add to the uncertainty about capacity needs. And lastly, uh, it is necessary to plan for them far in advance because capacity decisions often involve substantial financial and other resources. Um, for example, it may take years for a new power generating plant to be constructed and become operational. However, uh, this increases the risk that the designated uh, amount of capacity will not match actual demand when the capacity becomes available. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, how can we measure capacity? Okay, so as mentioned in 4.1, uh, capacity planning can be refined into two useful definitions, either design or effective uh, capacity. So again, uh, design capacity is the is a theoretical output, while the effective capacity is the real maximum outcome. Effective capacity is always less than the design capacity owing to realities of changing product mix, the need for periodic maintenance of equipment, lunch breaks, coffee breaks, problems in scheduling and balancing in operations, and similar circumstances. Actual output cannot exceed effective capacity and is often le less because of machine breakdowns, absenteeism, uh, shortages of materials and quality problems, as well as factors that are outside the control of the operations managers. Okay. So, the table here provides some examples of commonly used uh, measures of capacity. So, these different measures of, capa of capacity are useful in defining two measures of system effectiveness, and which are efficiency and utilization so we we cannot really rely with design capacity only or effective capacity only uh, these two should be used to come up with the efficiency uh, and utilization computation okay all right so moving on let's discuss efficiency and utilization so efficiency is the ratio of actual output of effective uh, capacity, while uh, capacity utilization is the ratio of actual output to design capacity. So maximizing utilization helps ensure that the company gets the most from their investment in machineries, people, etc. And identifies scheduling or maintenance problems that can leave non-productive gaps in the operations. Okay. On the other hand, uh, efficiency helps us to quickly identify problems with routings, uh, trainings, and costing. So both are actually important metrics. So we have an example uh, problem here. You know? uh, we have here the given design capacity of 50 trucks per day with effective capacity of 50 trucks per day. So uh, based on the... Uh, uh, computation earlier though, uh, design capacity of 50 trucks minus 10, let's say due to one staff is newly hired, so 10 is the uh, uh, difference, and then actual output of 36 trucks per day. So based on the computation using the given formula here on the right side of your screen, uh, efficiency is 90% and utilization is 72%. Uh, 90% efficiency looks pretty good right however uh, utilization is at 70 percent only which is much less impressive although probably more meaningful no? so at first uh, we might think of increasing actual output but since effective capacity here acts as a solid or the lid on actual output the real key to improving 
utilization is to increase effective capacity by correcting quality problems, uh, maintaining equipment in good operating condition, fully training uh, employees, and fully utilizing bottleneck equipment. So therefore, increasing utilization depends on being able to increase effective capacity. And this requires a knowledge of what constraint of what is constraining effective capacity. Okay. Moving on, uh, we now have the determinants of effective uh, capacity. All right. So for design capacity, it was set by the one who created the machine or did the floor plan or whoever conceptualized a certain process. So how about the effective capacity? How can we come up with that? Okay, so let's take a look on the determinants of effective capacity here. Okay, so first we have facilities. Okay, the design of facilities, including size and provision for expansion, is the key here. No? Locational factors such as uh, transfer, transportation costs, uh, distance to market, uh, labor supply, energy sources, and room for expansion are also important. Uh, in addition, layout of, uh, layout of the work area often determines how smoothly work can be, for, can be performed. Okay, and uh, environmental factors as well, no? such as heating, lighting, and ventilation also play a significant role in determining whether personnel can perform effectively or whether they must struggle to overcome Poor design characteristics. Okay. Next, we have product and service factors. Okay. Uh, so, product or service design can have tremendous influence on capacity. For example, uh, when items are similar, the ability of the system to produce those items is generally much greater than when we successive items differ. Okay. So a perfect example is a restaurant that offers a limited menu can casually can usually prepare and serve meals at a faster rate than a restaurant with extensive menu. Right? Next, we have the process, process factors. Uh, the quantity capability of a process is an obvious determinant of capacity. A more subtle determinant is the influence of out output quality. Uh, for instance, if quality of output does not meet standards, the rate of output will be slowed by the need for inspection and rework uh, activities. Uh, productivity also affects capacity, right? Process improvements that increase quality and productivity can result in increased capacity. Also, if multiple products or multiple services are processed in batches, the time to change over equipment settings must be taken into account. This is the reason why we do process audit, calibration, to know if there's a need for us to upgrade the process or incorporate technology to level up the quality of the output. Okay, next we have human factors. Okay, the tasks that uh, make up a job, the variety of activities involved, and the training, skill, and experience required to perform a job all have an impact on the potential and actual output. In addition, uh, employee motivation has a very basic relationship to capacity, as do absenteeism and labor turnover. Next, we have policy, right? Policy factors. Management policy can affect uh, capacity by allowing or not allowing capacity options such as overtime or second or third shifts, right? Okay, next we have the operational factors. Scheduling problems may occur when an organization has differences in equipment capabilities among alternative pieces of equipment or differences in job requirements. Uh, inventory stocking decisions, late deliveries, purchasing requirements, acceptability of purchase materials and parts, and quality inspection and control procedures can also have an impact on effective capacity. Inventory shortages of even one component of an assembled item can cause a temporary halt to assembly operations until the components become available. This can uh, have a major impact on effective capacity. Uh, thus, uh, in insufficient capacity in one area can affect overall capacity. 
Next, we have the supply chain factors. Yeah. So supply chain factors must be taken into account in capacity planning if substantial capacity changes are involved. Key questions include um, what impact will the changes have on suppliers, warehousing, uh, transportation, and distributors. Uh, if capacity will be increased, will these elements of supply chain be able to handle the increase? Uh, Conversely, if, if, if capacity is to be decreased, what impact will the loss of business have on these elements of the supply chain? Okay. Next, we have uh, external factors. Okay. So, last one. Uh, product, product standards, uh, especially minimum quality and performance standards, can restrict management's options for increasing and using capacity. Uh, thus, pollution standards on products and equipment often reduce effective capacity, as does paperwork required by government regulatory agencies by engaging employees in non-productive activities. A similar effect occurs when a union contract limits the number of hours and type of work an employee may do. Right? Okay, so that's all the determinants of effective capacity. Okay. So, yeah, let's now discuss how to formulate a strategy for capacity planning. Okay, so the three primary uh, strategies are uh, leading, following, and tracking. Okay, so leading capacity strategy builds capacity in anticipation of future demand increases. So, if capacity increases involve a long lead time this strategy may be the best option a following strategy builds capacity when demand exceeds current capacity right then a tracking strategy is similar to a following strategy but it adds capacity in relatively small increments to keep pace with the increasing demand okay so, an organization typically bases its uh, capacity strategy on assumptions and predictions about long-term demand patterns. Okay, uh, technological changes and behavior of its competitors. So, this typically involve uh, one growth rate and variability of demand, uh, two the cost of building and operating facilities of various sizes. Three, the rate and direction of technological innovation. Uh, four, the likely behavior of competitors. And five, availability of capital and other inputs. Okay, so in some instances, a decision may be made to incorporate a, uh, a capacity cushion. Uh, so when we say uh, capacity cushion, uh, it's amount of capacity in excess of expected demand when there is some uncertainty about demand. So, capaci capacity cushion is equal to uh, capacity minus expected demand. So, typically, the greater the degree of demand uncertainty, the greater the amount of cushion used. Organizations that have uh, standard products or services generally have smaller capacity cushions. Cost and competitive priorities are also key factors. Okay. So, yeah, uh, we now have the uh, steps in, in uh, uh, capacity planning. Right? So, first, we have, uh, we have to estimate future capacity requirements. So this can be done by using historical data such as sales report from past months or last year. Okay. Next, evaluate existing capacity and facilities and identify gaps. Okay, so is the existing design capacity works uh, for the demand that you're current that you currently have? Is there a way for you to bridge that gap? Uh, like getting another equipment to double the design capacity that you currently have. So, yeah, this, this type of evaluation based on the current business capacity is important in choosing the right strategy. Next, identify alternatives for meeting requirements. So, same with the evaluation of existing capacity. Um, how can we bridge the gaps that we notice? 
we need to come up with alternatives to meet the demand requirements. Next, conduct financial analysis of each alternative. Okay, so you are able to note uh, what are the gaps and even come up with the alternatives to bridge those gaps. So the next is to assess the cost of each alternative and its impact on your profit, investment, and business efficiency. So in, in section 4.11 later, we will discuss some ways on how we, uh, we can assess uh, or how we can evaluate alternatives, which also includes financial analysis methods. Okay, next. Assess key qualitative issues for each alternative. So aside from getting the advantages of the alternatives and its accompanying cause, you also have to assess any issues, well, if there's any, related to a certain alternative that you have. Next, select the alternative to pursue that uh, will be best in the long term. So at this stage, you, you were able to weigh all the considerations among the alternatives. So it's time to choose which one to implement. Okay, next, implement the selected alternative. So at this stage, you also have to do some knowledge transfer, no? If, if needed, especially if the chosen alternative will involve staff's participa participation in the actual process. Okay, and lastly, yeah, monitor results. Of course, you have to assess if the selected alternative is effective or not. So you have to set a specific timeline where you can do the observations, take notes, and see if there's a need to do some improvement or use another alternative. Okay, so yeah, now uh, we already know how to measure capacity, uh, formulate a strategy, and the steps in capacity planning. So let's now discuss the requirements of forecasting capacity. Okay. Okay. So capacity planning decisions involve both long-term and short-term considerations, right? So because the time intervals covered by each of these categories can vary significantly from industry to industry, it would be misleading to put times on the intervals. However, the distinction will serve as a framework within which to discuss capacity planning, okay? So long-term capacity needs require forecasting demand over, over time of horizon and then converting those forecasts into capacity requirements, okay? So figure 5.1 here illustrates some basic demand patterns that might be identified by a forecast. So in addition to basic patterns, there are more complex patterns such as combination of cycles and trends, right? So when trends are, that are identified, the fundamental issues are how long the trend might persist because few things uh, last forever, and two, the slope of the trend. So if, if cycles are identified, interest focuses on one, the approximate le length of the cycles, and two, the amplitude of the cycles. Okay. So on the other hand, short-term capacity needs are less concerned with cycles or trends that with seasonal variations or other variations from average. These deviations are particularly important because they can place a severe strain on a system's ability to satisfy demand at some times and yet result in idle uh, capacity at other times. So an organization can identify uh, seasonal uh, patterns using standard forecasting techniques. So Although uh, commonly thought as, uh, of as uh, annual fluctuations, seasonal variations are also re reflected in monthly, weekly, and even daily capacity requirements. So the table here uh, provides some examples of items that tend to exhibit seasonal demand patterns. Okay. So when time intervals are too short to have seasonal uh, variations in demand, the analysis can often describe the variations by probability distributions, such as a normal, uniform, or Poisson distribution. Okay. All right. So let's now go to the challenges of planning service capacity. Yeah. So 
Capacity planning sounds easy, especially if we are managing products. But how about capacity planning for services, right? Okay, so while the foregoing discussion relates generally to uh, capacity planning for both goods and services, it is important to note that uh, capacity planning for services can present special challenges due to the nature of services. Three very important factors in planning service capacity are one, there may be a need to be near customers. So convenience for customers is often an important aspect of service. Generally, a service must be located near customers. Next, the inability of to store services. Capacity also must be matched with the timing of demand. So unlike goods, services cannot be produced in one period and stored for use in a later period. So similarly, uh, inventories of goods allow customers to immediately satisfy wants, whereas a customer who wants a service may have to wait. This can result in a variety of negatives for an organization that provides a service. Thus, speed of delivery or customer waiting time becomes a major concern in service capacity planning. Next, the degree of volatility of demand. So demand volatility presents problems for capacity planners. Demand volatility tends to be higher for services than for goods, not only in timing of demand, um, but also in the amount of time required to serve individual customers. Um, for example, uh, bank tends to experience higher volumes of demand on, a cert on certain days of the week, and the number of nature of transactions tend to vary substantially for different individuals. Then two, uh, a wide variety of social, cultural, and even weather factors can cause major peaks and valleys in demand. The fact that services can't be stored means service systems cannot turn to inventory to smooth demand uh, requirements on the system the way goods producing systems are able to. Instead, uh, service planners have to devise other methods of coping with demand volatility and cyclical demand. For example, to cope with peak demands, demand periods, planners might consider hiring extra workers or hiring temporary workers, outsourcing some uh, or all of a service, or using pricing and promotion to shift some demand to slower rate periods. So in some instances, uh, demand management strategies can be used to offset capacity limitations. Okay, So we have... Uh, pricing, promotions, discounts, and similar tactics that uh, you know can help to shift some demand away from the peak periods and to slow periods, allowing organizations to achieve a closer match in supply and demand. Okay. All right. We're now in 4.8. Yeah, so given the process in doing the capacity planning and the challenges, especially for planning for services, should a business do capacity planning internally or they can just get someone to do it for them? So let's take a look on some considerations, whether to do it in-house or have it outsourced. Okay. So, um... Once capacity requirements have been determined, uh, the organization must decide whether to produce a good or provide a service itself or to outsource from another organization. Many organizations buy, buy parts or contract out services for a, a variety of reasons. Among those factors are, number one, availability capacity. So if an organization has available uh, the equipment uh, has the available equipment, uh, necessary skills, and time. It often makes sense to produce an item or perform a service in house. The additional cost would be relatively small compared with those required to buy items or subcontract services. On the other hand, outsourcing can increase capacity and flexibility. Next, expertise. So if a firm lacks the expertise to do a job 
satisfactorily. Buying might be a reasonable alternative, right? Next, quality. So, firms that specialize can uh, usually offer higher quality than an organization can attain itself. Uh, conversely, uh, unique quality requirements or the desire to closely monitor quality may cause an organization to perform a job itself. Okay, next, the nature of demand. So, when demand for an item is high and steady, uh, the organization is often better off doing the work itself. However, uh, wide fluctuations in demand or small orders are usually better handled by specialists who are able to uh, combine orders from multiple sources, which results in higher volume and tends to offset individual buyer fluctuations. Next, we have cost. So any cost savings uh, achieved from buying or making uh, must be weighed against the preceding factors. Cost savings might come from the item itself or from transportation cost savings. If there are fixed costs associated with making an item that cannot be reallocated, if the service or product is outsourced, that has to be re recognized in the analysis. So outsourcing may help a firm on this case to avoid incurring fixed costs. And lastly, risk. Buying goods or services may entail considerable risk, loss of their control over operations, knowledge sharing, and the possible need to disclose proprietary information are three risks. The liability can be tremendous risk if the products or services of other companies cause harm to customers or the environment, as well as damage to an organization's reputation. Reputation can also be damaged if the public discovers that a supplier operates with substandard working conditions. Okay, so in some cases, a firm might choose to perform part of the work itself and let others handle the rest in order to maintain flexibility and to hedge against loss of a uh, you know, subcontractor. If part or all of the work will be done in-house, capacity alternatives will need to be developed. Okay. There you go. So we're now at 4.9. So in 4.5 earlier, we discussed how to formulate a strategy and the steps in capacity planning. So on this topic or on this section, let's discuss how we develop strategies based on some business factors. Okay. So there are actually a number of ways to enhance development of capacity strategies. First is to design flexibility into systems. So the long-term nature of many capacity decisions and the risk inherent in long-term forecasts suggest potential benefits from designing flexible systems. So for example, uh, provision for future expansion in the original design of a structure frequently can be obtained at a small price compared to what it would be or what it would cost to remodel an existing uh, structure that did not have such a provision. Okay, next. Next is to take stage of life cycle into account. So capacity requirements are often closely linked to the stage of the life cycle that a product or services is in. Okay, so at the introduction phase, phase it can be difficult to determine both the size of the market and the organization's eventual share of that market. Therefore, organizations should be cautious in making large and uh, or inflexible capacity investments. On the other hand, in the growth phase, the overall market may experience rapid growth. However, the real issue is the rate at which the organization's market share grows which may be more or less than the market rate, so depending on the success of the organization's uh, strategies. Okay, in the maturity phase, the size of the market levels uh, off, and uh, organizations tend to have stable market shares. Um, organizations may still be able to increase profitability by reducing costs and making full use of capacity. Okay, but lastly, uh, in the decline phase, an organization is faced with uh, underutilization of capacity due to declining demand. 
organizations may eliminate the excess capacity by selling it or by introducing new products or services. Uh, an option that is uh, sometimes used in manufacturing is to transfer capacity to a location that has lower labor costs, which allows the organization to continue to make profit on the product for a while longer. Okay. Next. Third one is to take a big picture approach to capacity changes. Yeah. So when developing capacity uh, alternatives, it is important to consider how parts of the system interrelate. So changes in capacity inevitably have an impact on an organization supply chain. Suppliers may require time to adjust their capacity. So working with supply chain partners on capacity, increase plans uh, is critical. Suppliers, uh, distributors, and transporters are all included there. So the risk of failing to consider the big picture is that the system will become unbalanced. The presence of a bottleneck operation indicates an unbalanced system. A bottleneck operation is one in a sequence of operations that has lower capacity than the other operations in the sequence. So as a result, the capacity of the, bottle, of the bottleneck of, uh, operation limits system capacity. System capacity is limited to the uh, capacity of the bottle operation. Okay. Fourth one is to prepare the deal with capacity is to prepare to deal with capacity chunks, okay? So, capacity increases are uh, often acquired in fairly large chunks rather than smooth increments, making it difficult to achieve a match between desired capacity and feasible capacity. Um, for example, uh, the desired capacity of a certain operation may be 55 units per hour, but uh, suppose that machines used for this operation are able to produce 40 units per hour each. One machine by itself would cause capacity to be 15 units per hour short of what is needed, but two machines would result in an excess capacity of 25 units in per hour. Okay. Next is an attempt to smooth out capacity requirements. So, any unevenness in, in capacity requirements also can create certain problems. We can trace the, the unevenness in demand for, for products and services to a, variety, to a variety of sources such as uh, seasonal variations and vari variability uh, in demand. Okay, next. Okay, next is to identify the optimal operating level. So production units typically have an ideal or optimal level of operation in terms of unit cost of output. At the ideal level, cost per unit is the lowest for that production unit. If the output rate is, is less than the optimal level, increasing the output rate will result in decreasing average unit cost. Okay. And lastly, uh, choose a strategy if expansion is involved. So uh, consider whether incremental expansion or single step is more appropriate. Uh, factors include competitive pressures, uh, market opportunities, cost and availability of funds, uh, disruption of operations, and training requirements. Also, uh, decide whether to lead or follow competitors. Leading is more risky, but it may have greater potential for rewards. Okay. So we're now at 4.10. So aside from the challenges that we have discussed in 4.7, uh, which is specifically for services, uh, we also have some constraints that we need to manage in order for us to achieve successful capacity planning. Okay, so there are seven categories of constraints. Okay, first, we have the market. So uh, example of this is uh, insufficient demand. Next, we have resource. So we have too little of one or more resources, like uh, for example, uh, workers, equipment, and uh, space. Next, material. So either we have too little of one or more materials. 
Next, financial. So an example of this uh, is uh, insufficient funds. Next, supplier. Um, example of this is a, a reliable long lead time or a substandard quality uh, of products from, from supplier. Next, knowledge or competency. So uh, an example of this is uh, if, if there's a knowledge needed or a skills missing or incomplete uh, among the, the staffs. Okay. And lastly, policy. So there are laws or regulations interfering the business. No? All right. So that's our the that's our the constraints. So constraint issues can be resolved by using the following steps. Right? First, identify the most pressing constraint. If it can easily be overcome, do so and return to step one for the next constraint. Otherwise, proceed to step two. Okay, step two, change the operation to achieve the maximum benefit given the constraint, right? This may be a short-term solution. Next, make sure other portions of the process are supportive of the constraint, okay? Next, okay, uh, explore and evaluate ways to overcome the constraint. So this will depend on the type of constraint. For example, if demand is too low, Advertising or price change may be an option. If capacity is the issue, working over time, purchasing new equipment, and outsourcing are possible options. If additional funds are needed, working to improve cash flow, uh, borrowing and issuing stocks or bonds may be options. If suppliers are a problem, work with them, find more desirable suppliers, or do in-house. If knowledge or skills are needed, Seek training or consultants or a source, right? If laws or regulations are the issue, working with lawmakers or regulators may be an option. Okay? And lastly, yeah, repeat the process until the level of constraints, constraints is acceptable. Okay. Right? So, yeah. On this section, we will discuss the alternatives that we have in capacity planning and, and evaluating each of them based on business's nature and needs, right? So first, we have the cost volume analysis, okay? So cost volume analysis focuses on relationships uh, between cost, uh, revenue, and volume of output, okay? So the purpose of cost volume analysis is to estimate the income of an organization under different operating conditions. Okay, so use of the technique, use of this technique requires uh, identification of all costs related to the production of a given product. These costs are the are then designated as fixed costs or variable costs. Okay, so Fixed cost tends to remain constant regardless of volume of output. On the other hand, variable costs vary directly with volume of output. Okay. So cost volume analysis can be a valuable tool for comparing capacity alternatives if certain assumptions are satisfied. Okay. So one product is involved, everything produced can be sold. The variable cost per unit is the same regardless of the volume. Fixed costs do not change with volume changes or they are step changes. And the revenue per unit is the same regardless of volume. And lastly, revenue per unit exceeds variable cost per unit. Okay. Next, we have financial and All right. So, financial ana analysis is used to analyze whether an entity is stable, solvent, or liquid, or profitable enough to warrant a monetary investment. Okay. So, operations personnel need to have the ability to do financial analysis, a problem that, uh, that is universally encountered by managers is how to allocate scarce funds. 
A common approach is to use financial analysis to rank investment proposals, taking into account the time of, val of time value of money. Um, yeah, so two important terms in financial analysis are cash flow and present value. So cash flow refers to the difference between the cash received from sales of goods or services or other sources, okay, and the cash flow uh for labor materials overhead and taxes okay on the other hand uh present value expresses in current value of the sum of all future cash flows of an investment proposal okay so there are three most commonly used methods of uh, financial analysis now so first we have payback so payback method is a good one but widely used method that focuses on the length of time it will take for an investment to return its original cost. So payback ignores the time value of money. It use the it its use is easier to you know rationalize for short term than for long term projects. Okay. Next method we have the present value method. So it summarizes the initial cost of an investment, its estimated annual cash flows, and any expected salvage value in a single value called the uh, equivalent current value, taking into account the time value of money, like the interest rates. Okay. And as one, uh, internal rate of return or IRR. So this method identifies the rate of return that equates the estimated future returns and the initial cost. So these techniques are appropriate when there is a high degree of, uh, of certainty associated with uh, estimates of future cash flows. In, in many instances, however, um, operations managers and other managers must deal with situations better described as risky or uncertain. When conditions of risky or uncertainty are present, Decision theory is often applied. Okay. So next we have the decision theory. So decision decision theory is a helpful tool uh, for financial comparison of alternatives under conditions of risk or uncertainty. It is suited to uh, capacity decisions and to wide range of other uh, decision managers must make. Uh, it involves an identifying a set of possible future conditions that would uh, that could in influence results, uh, listing alternative courses of action, and uh, developing a financial outcome for each alternative future condition combination. Okay. Next, we have the waiting line analysis. So, uh. The traditional goal of uh, queuing analysis is to balance the cost of providing a level of service capacity with the cost of customers waiting for services. Right? So, analysis of lines is often uh, useful for designing or modifying service systems. So, waiting lines have a tendency to form in a wide variety of system service systems like airport, ticket counters, telephone calls to a cable te television company. Uh, hospital emergency rooms so yeah the lines are symptoms of bottleneck operations uh, analysis is useful in helping managers choose a capacity level that will be cost effective through balancing the cost of having customers wait with the cost of providing additional capacity it can aid in the determination of expected costs for various levels of service capacity okay and lastly, we have simulation. Yeah. So simulation can be a useful tool in evaluating uh, what-if scenarios. Okay. So we have now reached the uh, last topic of our chapter, which is uh, operation strategy. So let's quickly take a look on how operation managers do to manage capacity planning. Okay. So these are some of the strategies now that uh, they do to manage capacity or capacity planning. Okay, so the strategic implement implications of capacity decisions can be enormous now. 
uh, impacting all areas of the organization. So from an, orga from an operations management standpoint, um, capacity decisions establish a set of con conditions which, within which operation will be required to function. So uh, it is extremely uh, important to include inputs from operations management people in making capacity decisions. Okay. So yeah, flexibility can be a key issue in capacity decisions. Although uh, flexibility is not always an option, particularly in, in uh, capital intensive industries. However, where possible, uh, flexibility allows an organization to be agile. That is responsive to changes in the marketplace. Also, it reduces to a certain extent the dependence on long-range forecasts to accurately predict demand. And uh, flexibility makes it easier for organizations to take advantage of technological and other innovations. Maintaining excess capacity uh, may provide a degree of flexibility a bit at added cost. Okay. So, yeah, some organizations use a strategy of maintaining a capacity cushion for, uh, for the purpose of blocking entry into the market by new competitors. The excess capacity enables them to produce at, lower, at costs lower than what new competitors can. Uh, we have also mentioned this as part of a 4.5 uh, strategy formulation. However, such a strategy means higher than necess necessary unit costs, and it makes uh, it makes it more difficult to cut back if demand slows or uh, to shift to, to new product or service offerings. So, okay, uh, yeah. So efficiency improvements and utilization improvements can provide capacity increases. You no, know? so. Such improvements can be achieved by streamlining operations and reducing uh, waste. Bottleneck management can be a way to increase effective capacity by scheduling non bottleneck uh, operations to achieve maximum utilization of bottleneck operations. Okay, so in cases where capacity expansion will be undertaken, uh, there are two strategies for determining the timing and degree of, uh, of capacity expansion. One is the expand early strategy we have here. Yeah, so the intent might be uh, to achieve economies of scale, to expand market share, or to preempt uh, competitors from expanding. But the risk of this uh, strategy include an oversupply that would drive prices down and underutilized equipment that would result in higher unit costs. Okay, so the other approach is the wait and see strategy. Okay, so its advantage is to is, includes a lower chance of oversupply due to more accurate matching of supply and demand and higher capacity utilization. The queries are a um, loss of market share and the inability to meet demand if expansion requires a long lead time and there you have it uh, that concludes my report thanks everyone for listening